Salendra Draconi, A Novel Perspective of the Psychology of Warfare. Episode 1, The Anacron Campaign. Chapter 6, The First Casualty of the Dragonian Wars. In the previous chapter, a fierce purple dragon had attacked Case Parage and killed King Tobias of Eastern Pastia. In this chapter, a young castle guard named Private Dennis Lady has challenged the Dragon Man to a sword fight to defend the honor of his kingdom. The overall malaise that General Markdorf felt about the human counterparts, vis a vis their apparent inability to defend themselves effectively, dissipated the very instant Private Lady's sword clashed with the dragons. The young man was a superb swordsman, eating each of the dragon's strong, bone-jarring sprites with lightning-quick jabs, parries, blocks, and a considerable amount of fancy footwork. It would almost be described as a dance, assuming one felt inclined to speak lightly of a mortal duel between a powerful, indeed overpowered dragon warrior and a young but brave human soldier. Our friends tried to assist the private as much as they could, sending a barrage of fire and lightning attacks during the opening moments of the fight. But these attacks barely even distracted the dragons, as he simply absorbed the magic energy. Brutodar's contribution to this fight was to pick up a rock and prepare to throw it, but the combatants constantly circled around each other, chased each other around the icy water fountain, and desperately sought the slightest modicum of vulnerability in their opponent's defense, which may then be most expeditiously exploited. As such, Brutodar found he could not throw his rock in the safe direction without the risk of hitting the Garden Knight. In a sudden second of serendipity, the type that is usually only found in poorly written fantasy fiction, our friends were presented an opportunity to end the fight. The dragon, who had knocked Private Lady to the ground momentarily, briefly oriented his previously wounded soldier in the direction of Budadar's large stone. Seeing his one and only opportunity, he then aimed carefully and released his projectile. Once again, he hit his target as the stone smacked his shoulder, injuring him even further and sent him down to his knees as searing pain shot through his arm. Private Lady, quite certain he would not present it with another clear target, instantly took the chance. He sprung towards the dragon and delivered a deep slash to his throat and shoulder, but this attack came with a considerable cost, as the dragon jabbed his shadow magic infused sword between the shoulder's ribs. The squishing, crunching sound of the steel blade piercing soft flesh would have been horrendous enough, but the dragon was not yet finished. He expelled a particularly nasty shadow bolt which passed through his sword, still lodged in the private's chest. The sheer force of this magic spell sent the young man flying across the courtyard. He landed on his back with a loud thud, as his infected blood spewed forth from the deep hole in his chest, and he cried out from the pain. The fire dragons, Marco Dar and the three warriors that had just arrived, circled around the mortally ruined of purple dragon. They were now aware that the fire attacks would be ineffective, but they were willing to use whatever physical force was necessary to keep their enemy at bay. This was hardly necessary as he kneeled down on the ground, dropped his sword, and clutched the wound across his throat to stop the bleeding. Slinger ran over to tend to the human soldier. Her mother, the powerful priestess, had taught her a few simple healing techniques, and she was desperately trying to cast any spells that she could try to save his life. Brutodar, meanwhile, looked over towards the Great Hall and spied another tool that he could use in this fight. Stirk! he yelled loudly and ran towards the doors of the Great Hall. About a half dozen castle attendants were pulling Brutodar's excessively heavy hammer in the handcart, the squeaking wheels barely holding steady under the massive weight. Without the slightest hint of effort, Brutodar picked up his hammer, tossed it playfully from one hand to the next, and then heaved it over his shoulder. The castle attendants moaned loudly and collapsed in pure exhaustion from all their effort. The dragon, seeing Brutodar in his stick facing ominously towards him, made one last attempt to pick up his sword, which was at that point lying on the ground next to his knees. It was far too late for Brutodar swung his hammer in a wide circle and slammed the head into the dragon's chest, and sent his broken and bloody body sailing into the castle wall. The inner wall buckled from sheer force, a large hole forming the wall and loose bricks and dust fell on top of him. Even still, he tried to recover and push himself up, but he could no longer move. Brutodar then walked over to him, hoisted his hammer high above his head, and brought it down with every ounce of strength he had. Then, upon seeing what remained of the dragon's bloody carcass, lying in the grater of the mall it left in the stone floor of the courtyard, he experienced a most horrid, visceral reaction in which he vomited every scrap of food he had shoved in his mouth in the previous chapter. I need some help over here, Slender pleaded. 
Markadar instructed his warriors to set fire to the dragon's body, which he presumed to take some time since the dragon had previously absorbed all of their fire attacks. Luckily, his remains proved easier to burn. He then looked over at Brudodar, who merely sat and cried mournfully over the destructive result of his actions. You have defended the castle, Markadar told him. You protected the princess. But Brudodar remained inconsolable. Help me! Slyndra cried more urgently. Get out of my way! A shrill voice yelled from behind a crowd of villagers at the entrance of the castle courtyard. As the crowd parted, a young lady ran past the villagers and made her way to Private Lady's side. The petite woman was wearing a blue dress which reached all the way down to her brown leather boots. Her boots and the hem of her dress were covered in dirt and mud as it appeared that she had done a considerable amount of traveling. There was a large brown canvas bag strapped over her shoulder which she held in place at her hip as she moved. She also wore a large round blue hat tied to the top of her bright red hair with a thin leather chin strap. As she ran across the courtyard, her hat flew off her head and dangled from the back of her neck, revealing a pair of prominently pointed ears. Apparently, she was at least half-elf. As important as the women of her order would become over the next few years, at this point, none of the people assembled had ever seen an Azulette. What happened to him? The girl demanded as she pulled her back strap over her head and lowered the burden to the ground. Shadow attack from a purple dragon, Slender explained, pointing to the burning carcass behind her. Oh, holy excrement, the Azulette explained, saying a phrase which was remarkably inconsistent with everything the reader will eventually learn about Lady Elizabeth. After donning a pair of thin sanitary gloves, devices that probably would not exist in real life, Elizabeth unclipped the soldier's cape and pulled it out from under his back. Then she learned a horrible truth. The dragon's shadow attack was slowly turning the shoulder's blood to acid, and it had burned through the bottom of his cape. Completely undaunted, she calmly wielded a sharp knife and cut a clean strip off the cape. This she folded into a square and applied it to the chest wound. The soldier's blood almost instantly burned through the cloth, but she remained not nearly daunted and rummaged through her bag and pulled out a proper bandage roll. She cut off a portion of it, folded it, and placed it on the wound. Once again, the acidified blood burned through the bandage. She then sat back on her heels and wore a shocked look on her face. She was now considerably daunted indeed. A lonely monk whose formal occupation in the city appeared to be the development of new strains of green beans and coffee, and therefore of no bloody use at all in an emergency situation, tried to assert himself nonetheless. Dressed in a drab brown cassock with a thin rope tied around his waist, he ran over from the crowd and assembled town folks and kneeled down next to Elizabeth. What can I do to help? he inquired. A sharp cry of pain escaped from the private lips and woke Elizabeth from her shock. Slyndra answered with another healing spell, but as previously stated, this accomplished very little. There is one thing, the girl said, and then pulled a collapsible cup from her bag. This she popped out to its full length and handed to the monk. Fill this with water up to the red line, she instructed him. Of course, he replied and immediately stood to run to the fountain. But suddenly he stopped, looked back at Elizabeth, and voiced his concern. Oh, no, I know what this means. He then started shaking his head vigorously. No, 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 no. Elizabeth snapped to her feet at once and pointed her knife at the monk's neck. What did you just say to me? Now, when Ashley is officially a civilian. However, conventional theory dictates that they hold a brevity rank just below that of the commanding officer, or, assuming that one is present, one rank below the senior most attending field surgeon. Elizabeth always took her job very seriously and allowed absolutely no quarter to anyone who interfered with her treatment of the sick and wounded. Look at the size of that knife, exclaimed one of the guckers, a remark which earned him a sharp slap to the back of his head. Markadar started to walk towards her. Easy now, my lady, he warned. Elizabeth gave him a fierce look and even he backed away slowly. I cannot follow this order, the monk said carefully, still staring down the business end of the surgical knife. The church will never allow it. I cannot permit this soldier to die unnaturally. Satiated, the girl lowered the knife and returned it to its sheath. Very well. I would never want you to disrespect your religion, but do me a favor and take a look at this soldier. She pointed her finger down at the dying soldier, still moaning in pain. Elizabeth was still applying her healing spells. Look at him, Elizabeth demanded sharply. The monk looked down at Private Lady. The holy man's tears, sweating his eyes, complimented the compassion welling in his heart for the plight of the wounded soldier. The private cried out as searing pain surged through his chest, and Solyndra cast yet another furtive healing spell. While she quietly cursed herself for only temporarily doling the pain, the private appreciated even the momentary relief that the dragon has provided. 
Elizabeth pulled the sleeve of the monk's robes and explained to him, Now you understand that the soldier is going to die. Slender shot her an angered look and her eyes shifted from bright blue to deep red. Elizabeth apparently ignored her and continued to address the monk. As his blood continues to turn to acid, it will deteriorate all of his vital organs in his body until he ultimately dies from asphyxiation and heart failure. This is the very best scenario. After all, it's far more likely that the shadow of the hour will infest his central nervous system and inflame all of his nerve cells simultaneously, producing the feeling that each of his members of his body are being sliced asunder at every joint. And then he will die of asphyxiation and heart failure, his last moments of life being spent suffering such excruciating pain that women in childbirth breathe the deep sigh of relief that their pain will be quite bearable by comparison. At that very moment, the soldier arches back and let out an extremely loud and sharp crab pain. <coughs> all of the villagers rushed into the courtyard, and it was all Markadark can do to keep them at bay with frightening displays of fire magic. The three other fire dragons quickly entered the cremation duties and ran over to the private lady's side. Their eyes, much like Slyndra, had turned bright red as they were angered that there was nothing they could do for them. But Slyndra's eyes turned a different color at that moment as they shifted from blood red to a very dark and foreboding violet. All Dragonkind knew this to be a signal of abiding sadness and despair. Elizabeth clenched her fists as she ominously informed the monk, You will remember this being for the rest of your life. However, I do not wish to disparage your religion, so hand me that cup and I will fill it myself. Without another word of protest, the monk turned and ran, practically tripping over the hem of his cassock as he made his way to the fountain, trembling terribly as he dipped his cup into the water. He tried to tell himself that he was shivering from the cold and air and the icy water of the fountain, as he was unwilling to admit that he was terrified about his role in the soldier's impending death. The cup full, the monk delivered the water to Lady Elizabeth. One of the local fishermen, a friend of the young soldier, had had more than he could take. Daring to run past the column of fire magic place in front of him, he reared back and punched Markadar square in the jaw and tried to run past him. The elf, recovering quickly, grabbed the fisherman and held him back. Won't you help that man? The fisherman cried urgently. Why the f are you just standing around? Do something! He then dropped to his knees and wept bitterly, though this was quite drowned out from the private's continuous horrible screams. Markadar did his best to try to console the fisherman, but to no avail. The kilted man, the dagger-wielding ironmonger previously described, stepped forward and tried to calm the young fisherman, pulling back on his arm and urging him to fall back with the other villagers, but his friend refused to move from his chosen location. Unfortunately, the only person who could do something at that moment was Elizabeth. She reached into her bag and pulled out a clear vial filled with the fine green powder. She paused briefly to mentally prepare herself for her duty. This was the most grim test that any Azulette could be expected to perform, and what was worse that she never actually did this before. She was nervous, as a myriad of questions circled around her head. What if she did it wrong? What if the measurements were not accurate? What if the water was too cold for the concoction to take effect? What if it did not work against a purple jacket poison attack? Yet, performing her task as she had been trained, she slowly poured a small portion of the water until it was right at the red line. She then mixed in a small spoonful of the powder into the water, the mixture fizzled for a few seconds before the powder dissipated into the water. The mixture was supposed to be the same pale green color as the underside of the logo sleeve, but since it was so close to sunset, it was too dark to tell for certain. She brought the cup to the lips of the soldier, but Lady, being so delirious from the pain, barely registered that the woman was kneeling next to him. Drink this, soldier, she admonished him. It will help the pain. Much to relief, the soldier understood this instruction and raised his head up enough to drink the potion. But a few seconds later, he began to cough and Elizabeth leaned back so she would not get sprayed by the poison blood and acid. Once Lady had stopped coughing, she returned the cup to his lips. She saw that the acid on his lip was starting to dissolve the cup itself, but this was hardly a concern at the moment. After a moment, the potion began to work, and a look of profound relief came across the soldier's face. As the pain subsided, his body relaxed and he looked up to the face of the Azulet. Are, are you an angel? She smiled sweetly at him, her emerald green eyes dampened by tears. No, soldier. I am Lady Elizabeth, the Azulette. But he would hear none of it. No, no, you're an angel, he declared by fiat by slowly shaking his head. Then he looked up at the sky, the setting suns casting a beautiful ruby hue that almost matched Elizabeth's fiery red hair. Look, I see heaven. The monk cocked his head curiously. What's it look like? Private Lady took a few seconds to try to find the right words. Of course, we can forgive him for failing in this endeavor. It's... Glorious! 
His eyes then rolled to the back of his head and his body relaxed. His voice crackling and his words stammering, the monk managed to say a short but well-meant prayer for the soldier's soul. He ended with the phrase, Precious is the death of the righteous in the eyes of Todd. Psalms 116, verse 15. That concludes this segment of Slender Dragon Eye and our perspective of the psychology of warfare. In the next edition, the villagers of Anacron City respond to the present tragedy. If you wish to support me in my work, please purchase the original book from Animals on Kindle from the link in the description box below. And for the more heroic among you who wish to view more of my wonderful content, feel free to hit the subscribe button.